Okay guys, so in this video I'm going to show you how to build your own storybook. So let's get into it. We're basically going to cover how to set up your own isolate, well, a way to set up your own isolate development setup and just to talk a little bit about why you may want to consider doing something like this instead of using wrapper technology and I'll touch on that as well. So Storybook is one of the most popular complement projects that you will find for React. There's quite a lot of people using it. It's uh, enormously popular and although I, you know, I tip my hat to the hard work that the contributors of Storybook is putting into that project. I try myself to avoid it if at all possible because the fundamental problem that you will have with Storybook is that it is what I call a wrapper technology. It is in other words a convenience project that simply abstracts away a well, basically features and functionality and other tools that you yourself could actually depend on. Yourself, uh, depend on. And you most likely are. There's quite a few times where I've had issues with Storybook because of version incompatibilities with like Webpack and Babel. Uh, when the Babel 7 upgrade came out, our, my, my <laughs> project, well, basically Storybook was down until a bug fix on the project maintainer side could be produced. And during that time, I mean, I couldn't really use it. And th these sorts of issues, they are kind of constant. So, and the biggest issue with wrapper technology is that, in essence, what you're doing is that you are allowing another party to add a bunch of dependencies to your project. And even though you may not actually use all the features that is in this wrapper, you're still going to have to depend on them. And you're still going to have to cater to whatever happens with that project. And that is a big unnecessary risk and possible cause for issues in your own project. It's not the first time I've had issues with my releases and my deadlines due to the fact that Storybook was simply not working at the time. There was bugs or something was causing an issue. So what I try to do is to really ask myself whether or not I actually need this. There are use cases for Storybook, but on average I would say that if you are going for a large-scale project, there's very little reason in my mind to use such a to use Storybook. Unless, because there's actually not that much work involved in building something yourself. And if you do it, I mean, I'll show you what I did for a like one of uh, one of the world's biggest e-commerce sites, they're still using that in production, and it's working. App, you know, it doesn't have any of these issues, and it's extensible and customizable in any fashion that the development team wants. So let's get into it. The basic idea is that you simply have a developer directory here, or a dev, like whatever you want. You can call it whatever you want. So. Remember, Storybook is just a wrapper around other tools. So here I have my configuration file, my Webpack config file, for just doing isolated development. So what I do is that I actually separate out my actual production code from my developer environment. So all we really need to do here is to have this mindset, okay, I have two servers, or rather one directory that represents my development environment, and one directory that is actually my actual production code, right? So the, pro and the project that we're going to look at is basically this. This is my storybook and I threw this together in, I don't know, I built this application in maybe an hour, something like that. It's not a very complicated one, and it, like the components themselves are of course very trivial, but this will scale up to any size of project. So I can just select these as I want, and if I want to actually open them in a separate tab and actually, a tab and actually just work on this one component, I can actually do that. And yeah, and I can, you know, I can submit like some stuff here and hey, there's some some message and so forth. So we're going to look a little bit closer at that. So first and foremost, here is my just like my developer configuration for, well, basically doing this sort of development. And then, of course, I have my own, you know, this is my production, well, for the actual project itself. So if we go and have a look here, at the source of this project. So this is a very simple application. It's just a kind of toy project to illustrate this idea. And I have an index.html file here with some basic styles. Here's my public directory with some styles. And I have 
a main CSS file that I compile, which, which contains all my styles, some basic global styles. And here's my JS file, and here's the root of my little React application, and here's my app, which is just going to have some basic routing, and we have two pages, good. And here's my home page, which is just this little component here. And this structure here should feel fairly familiar. It's a fairly, you know, a fairly popular way of structuring your project. And then you can kind of burrow down here and get even deeper into like these different, like these components. So what's the magic about this? So let's have a look at the server for my development environment. So here's my server and it is, as you can see, it's just a Express server. And I'm depending on my, well, basically the Webpack dev middleware here that allows me to, well, basically just run Webpack through the server instead of using the Webpack dev server, which is another, you know, unnecessary, like, unnecessarily large project. Because I don't really, I don't want that wrapper technology. I just want the actual hook. I want this middleware because it's as minimalistic as it can get. And then I have my webpack hot, well, hot middleware basically, so that I can actually trigger or rather hook into re-renderings on the page, rather changes in my my in my code, and so I can then use the hot module plugin to actually reload the page and get all of those benefits. And that's code that you know some people put that in their production code and just do like environmental switches on it, and I just don't think that that's a good idea. I prefer, as I stated, it's in my world better to isolate that into a separate server and simply have a server that is dedicated to doing component updates and just kind of separate that. That's just my personal preference. And here I have actually stubbed off a few endpoints, which we will call when different components interact. So that's one of the benefits to this, where since you're actually running your own server when you are working in your dev environment, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you can it's a full-fledged server. If you have network calls or some stuff that you have as a dependency in your components, there's nothing stopping you from just keeping that code around and you can do whatever, like you can just add those fake endpoints on the server. Easy peasy. And then I have two structures to this. So I have my routes for slash dev, which is basically going to serve up the dev HTML, and then I have one for showcase. And we'll actually look at that now. So the difference here is the dev is the, this is basically the enter point into my development application, and then it, this is the enter point into the showcase. So the showcase is this application here, where you basically have an uh, option of just listing out all your components like this. And the dev, as you can probably imagine, is just this thing here where I actually look at the component itself. You don't have to structure things this way, it's just the way that feels intuitive to me. So let's look at the dev container first because it's probably the easiest one. So here we have a simple well, application component, like the root component. And it's just going to depend on React hot loader so that, you know, if I make a update to the page, it's actually just going to cas cascade and or it's going to just refresh immediately. And this is very, I could, the way that the, doing this in this manner is actually very useful when the project grows to be really, really big because re, like having hot module reloading is very, very heavy when you have really heavy webpack configurations or very heavy builds or big applications. So what is this list thing? Well, let's have a look at list. So list is basically this. It is simply a file that where I import my different components from wherever in my production code I have it. So instead of having the idea of a story JS file or something that is actually put into production, like into the actual source code, I simply have a single entry point where I load in all of my components. I mean, I do this explicitly because I think it's more expressive and clearer and I get a good overview of like basically all the components that I'm pulling into my little development environment here. And this could, of course, be automated. You mean we could recursively just require and buy all these components if we wanted that as well. But I think that this is a little bit better. And then I just export this list where I declare a, well, a title for the component, the actual component, and the route or the path that I want this to be set under. And then we can see here in the dev container, all it's gonna do is that it's simply going to loop through all of this list of components and grab, or rather, 
find the component that matches my current path name. So when I link to, like, that's basically what's happening here. So my about component, if I click this link, hey, I'm at this route, and now I'm going to load up that component, and I can start working on it. And for the showcase, it's very similar where, well, basically we grab the list again, and I have some wrapper styles here. We'll look at the, that in just a moment. And basically all that's happening now is that I'm looping through the map, uh, this list again, and I'm simply creating this list of the different elements that I want, or rather the links that I want to be able to click. And just as I do that, I do a similar thing here for creating the routes. And yeah, that's that's basically the, the entire like that's the entire application. There's not much magic. Like it's just rendering out the list of all these components. And whenever I click a route, I'm simply attaching. As you can see, I'm simply attaching the proper component or the correct component to my content area, and yeah, that's the entire. The, the, this is now a fully fledged, like a, a very simple version of the features the storybook provides, and I can start working on it. So here I have some like the HTML file, very simple, and finally I have this. As you saw, I required this little dev CSS file, and all this is, is basically me importing all of the styles that is in this file here, which contains all of the styles from the from the project, and just appending a few of my like dev environment specific things. So if I have stylings that need, are related to my actual, you know, to the dev environment, I can append them here as well. So let's look at the list again. So you'll notice here that I am requiring something called feedback form wrapper, product list wrapper, product list item wrapper. So what's that about? Let's have a look at that. So one of the things that I do here is that basically we might have this product list component, which is a simple component that simply is going to render out a, well, well, this is the product list itself, actually. So no, this is the same component that we're looking for. So this is just an element, a list element. And a wrapper is simply me declaring some a component that is wrapping this subcomponent. So for me showing this product list item, I mean, there's like I don't really need to add the complexity of say stories or so forth. It's just a wrapper that uh, I can use in order to depend on into my like in my develop development environment. So I can just style this higher order like this this component and pull in the actual component that I want to show and just, just occupy it with the static information that it needs. The same thing goes for the product list here. So basically I have a bunch of products that is just by default empty and I'm rendering out this list. This is basically, well, this is the list item and this is the list of components, right? So where is this, that coming from? Well, basically I have, as I said, I have this wrapper that is just pulling in a fixture file, which is this little, well, this little file here that just exports some static information and then I am simply requiring this component instead of the production component when I'm in my de in development environment. But I can do other things as well. So let's say that I actually have a network request. Let's say that my component is actually ne actually needs to talk to a network. Well, that's also pretty straightforward. So let's go into my about here and we see that I have this feedback form component here. So here's my feedback form. And basically all this is gonna do is that whenever I submit something, it's gonna post a message or well, it's gonna make a post with the value of this form and it's going to go to the network and it's basically going to you call a, in this case, a Redux handler. Well, I'm using Redux for this component. So you can see here, this is my container and this is my view component. And basically all I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna dispatch a Redux message. And that's also support, I can mean, I can, I can add this support into like to this solution as well. So I have declared my form reducer when there's actually a message incoming and then I'm just gonna put that on my state. And from my feedback form wrapper, all I have to do is that, all right, I just require all of the things that I need. I create my, re I just combine my reducers, which is going to give me, well, it's gonna give me the state or my main reducer. And then I can create a store and wrap this in a provider and there's my feedback form. And now for all, I, I don't even have to, I can, can pretty much do whatever I want. So now I can actually just 
wrap this one component in the reducer or give it the state and wrap it in a current provider without having to depend on the rest of the application, which is also kind of cool, I think. So that's one thing you can, I mean, that, that's also something you can do. And as you see here for like the product list, um, we look at, let's see here. No, it's actually in the about section, I think. So about JS was static, is it home then? Let's see if I remember here. Yeah, so here we have the home page or like the main page we saw here. This thing here, which is like just showing the product list and all the list items. Now this is actually, as you can see here, this component is when it's mounting, it's actually gonna do a network request. And that's the thing we saw earlier where, all right, I wanna do a network request because that's the natural behavior of my components. So by doing that and having the server here simply fake this response here with the product list information, which is basically just that fixture file you saw earlier, which with those that fake data, I can I can actually maintain that behavior. I don't have to have any type of magic code that just fakes off my network calls or anything like that. It's fairly it's very simple, if you will. And the same goes for the feedback. So if I go to the network here and I refresh this page, you'll see that hey, going to products, and here is actually my response. To, uh, that, that's actually now going to my server. If I enter something here, I actually go to the server and I get my fake data back. So it's very like it's fairly extensible. And I, all I can say is that this way of working is, in my opinion, fairly. It's not that much work to set this up. And the benefit is that now you can only like you can be sure that there will be no collisions between your own code and say something like storybook or so because at the end of the day what you're going for is to be able to have a stable working environment where you can work in isolation develop your your, your different components but you also want to have the flexibility in my experience especially when the product is long running and it's going to have a lot of people working on it and your requirements are going to change over the years you you want a solution that is not locking you into decisions made by a third party because remember whatever storybook and their team decides to do that's now because of you because you depend on them you have to kind of account for that and you're basically forced to find solutions that fit within their uh, like the, their framework or like their product but if you do this you basically gain the same you get you, you get the same thing it's just that now you are in full control you can do whatever you want and I've found like I can only speak from experience this has worked very well for me and my team uh, you don't have to do things exactly this way but I can just say that it doesn't take that much time to build your own implementation of storybook and this in my Personally, I think is it's safer over to, to maintain over time. And finally, it's going to most likely be more powerful. So I uh, hopefully gave you some ideas about what you can do as an alternative if you're going to work on a long running project and you want to set up some type of isolated development environment. Have a great day.